So we talked about some of the dangers. What are some ways we can reduce the risks around handling drug paraphernalia when we have encounters with people? I think that uh, communication is number one. I think that um, when you have encounters with people, generally it always starts with an officer presence. That's the first use of force that you have. And um, most encounters would be what are called you know, field contacts or field interviews, and that's when you're getting as much information as you possibly can. Not only about the call for service, but also inherent dangers for the call. You know, you're paying attention to everyone around you and you're trying to find, kind of size up the person you're talking to, whether they're a victim or suspect. And I think that when you're in that information gathering stage of the interview, um, asking them, just straight up asking them, is there anything in your pockets that I need to know about that might stick, stag, poke, or hurt me? Um, and if they tell you, great, can I get it? Can I take it out just so that I'm safe? Um, if they say, no, there's not anything in my pockets, you can ask them, well, do you mind if I check? Do you mind if I just make sure? And nine or 10 times they, they consent to that and you can make sure that there's nothing as far as crack pipes or syringes um, before you go any further with the investigation. That kind of eliminates one of the variables that could fall back in, in the back of your mind. Um, it makes everything safer. Um, I think the conversation is a big deal. I, working some of the teams I worked on, um, I would often come across the same people over and over again. And if we had had a, a, a fair and honest conversation the first couple of times and they knew that I wasn't um, going to BS them and I was going to do exactly what I said I was going to do, I know it's a strange thing to think of, but you can actually build a little trust or almost like a working relationship. Like, we're going to encounter each other. I need to make sure that, you know, if I if I have to go through with them or pat them down, you know, if, if, if we just have an upfront conversation, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want this to turn into something more than it is right now but I'm gonna have to pat you down and tell me right now. And, and, if, and if you, you know, sometimes I would take people, if there's a lot going on, a lot of people going through people or, you know, officers interviewing people, there'd been a disturbance or a fight or something. If I could move them over a little bit, kind of out of the fray and have a quiet conversation with them and they knew that I wasn't full of shit and I wasn't heavy handed and I wasn't gonna, you know, I wasn't gonna mess with them or get them in trouble or, or you know, you'd, You'd be surprised what they're more concerned about on the street. Sometimes it's not even an arrest. Sometimes it's you know ten other things. But um, having the conversations, uh, you know, you gotta at least try. And then from there, um, going slowly if you can. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the situation is urgent. Sometimes you have chased them down an alley and you have them up against the wall and you're by yourself. And you know help is coming, but you don't know where it is and you have to go through them very quickly. Knife, gun, bulge, whatever. Get them in handcuffs and get them back somewhere that's safer. And then maybe you have time to do it slowly. But slow is the key, in my experience, too. To so take your time. Not always possible, but um, you know, it's. I think it's what you should strive for. Using, using gloves if you can is also really helpful. You know, we were talking before that in the winter time, it's often, it's often difficult with people with a lot of clothing on and. Uh, Sometimes it's hard if you, I know a lot of guys didn't use gloves when they were searching just because you can't feel things very well. Uh -huh. um, but I would often go through people peripherally. Then if I thought there was something there, then I would put gloves on to go in and, and retrieve it just for a level of safety if I could do it. If I had time, if I had some on my, you know, on my belt, it just depended. Um, but as, I think as you grow in your experience, then you kind of, you make mistakes early at least I did, and then you know you recover from those, and you you create new patterns and new things you're going to do later. Um, and you know, it doesn't occur to you at the very beginning. I think, at least in my career, when I was new and excited to be on the street, to I wasn't really worried about my safety. You know, I didn't think to put gloves on. No one else had gloves. Why, why would I have gloves? I don't need gloves. I have all this other stuff. Why do I have to carry that? And then, you know, you get into some situations, you realize that you do want to go home every night, and you don't want to go home with some something that's going to keep you sick all the time. So. Um, yeah, it's, I think you, you grow in experience and, and um, there's lots of ways, things you can learn on the street to kind of keep yourself safe, but, you know, we get busy and we don't necessarily do it all the time, mm -hmm. so. Probably some of the more, more obvious things would be um, things like um, needle stick resistant gloves. Um, the problem with that is, as, as we know, most agencies aren't going to pay for that. They're relatively expensive. They can run up to $200. The chances of them being lost is, is great or the possibility of someone taking them is great. And needless to say, if you come into any type of blood exposure or blood contact with the gloves, you technically should remove those gloves and replace them with another one. So um, when it comes to a personal expense to a lot of law enforcement agents, that's probably something that's not going to happen. 
I would say at the very least, you should be making it your point to always carry around like just numerous pairs of latex gloves at the very least. And that would be for any list body search. Just just assume there was no drug paraphernalia, no syringes, no crack pipes, no nothing. It's just it's just a, a fair way to do the search. Completely agree with what, what Jim was saying about um, especially cold weather climates where where you know law enforcement personnel may be wearing thicker gloves, leather gloves. You just really can't feel things the way you would want to, and that becomes like one of the resistant things. But I guess for me, and, and I'm going to look back at this as like just what, what, where the mindset is and what I would be thinking in a given situation. I think, and I'm going to preface this by saying that every single suspect needs to be treated with a degree of respect. I need that to be understood because I don't want this to be misconstrued that, you know, but the moment that I'm chasing someone down the alley, at that particular moment there, we are on two divergent sides of the fence. We are. I'm a law enforcement person, and for whatever reason, I'm under the belief that there was a law that was broken somewhere. Okay, so I need to start to make an assumption, and with that assumption are going to be assumptions that any and everything that could happen to me bad, one, I don't want to happen, and two, I'm going to do my best to prevent it from happening. So I think one of the ways, one of the precautions that you can use is just you approach your situations, once again, with the respect that everyone deserves, but with the notion that there is a high probability that there's something that's going to be there. I work with the high probability that if I drive down the highway at 150 miles an hour and I get involved in a car accident, it's a strong likelihood that I may not survive that accident. I also work with the notion of knowing that every single time I approach someone, there's a likelihood they may be in possession of something that they shouldn't have, all right, something that I may be confiscating from them or something I need to be cautious about. And with that constant ongoing notion, probably, and I'm going to just just take a tangent for just one brief second, probably one of the highest incidents of, of, of responding local officers being hurt in incidents is probably domestic disputes. Mm -hmm. Most domestic disputes really start with just basically coming up to a scene and watching a husband scream at a wife and a wife scream at a husband or a girlfriend scream at a boyfriend and the like. So once action is taken upon either one of them, be it the woman or the man, the other person, the other spouse, the other significant other, realize what's going on and then all of a sudden now you're fighting against both of them and officers have been seriously hurt. The assumptive thought when they arrived there was that this doesn't pertain to us, it pertains to them. So they don't see the inherent danger. I think the approach, the approach constantly has to assume that there's an inherent danger. The approach has to assume that every single person in a designated environment, if it's deemed to be a drug area or a drug infested area or a drug using area, the assumptive thought has to be that yes, there would be a possibility of a syringe being found or a crack pipe being found. And then you go through your process, your police protocols and process with that knowledge in front of you. One of the other things I did want to highlight that some officers have found helpful is carrying a biohazard container and offering uh, the individual that they're having contact with the option of putting it in there. And that way the law enforcement officer doesn't have to handle the equipment at all, which they have found helpful, but it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. But giving the option is nice. <laughs> Um, but on that note, what can we say to drug users and people who are carrying syringes such as diabetics to try and make them declare that they're even carrying it in the first place? What have you found helpful during your career? Based on the research that I've come across recently, I, I see that um, there's statistics that show that people are more likely to declare that they have an illegal syringe on them if there's no fear of being arrested. and. I also know that based on interview and interrogation techniques, building the rapport, building that trust that you were talking about, um, one technique that is used often is eliminating the possibility of getting arrested just with your words, just saying, I'm not going to arrest you about this. I just want to know whatever it is that you want to know. Towards the end of my career, the job that I was doing, and I'm sure you have the same, or maybe have the same experience, I wasn't that concerned about paraphernalia. Honestly, mm -hmm. it, it's not, it wasn't a big priority for me. Um, and so I would just simply say, it, it, it always depended upon the situation. I just don't want to get hurt and I don't want you to get hurt. And you know, sometimes I joke around, look, it's a lot of paperwork. I don't, I don't have time, I don't have to take you to the hospital. Like make a joke out of it if that's the situation. But you know, if you can come down a little bit from, from the excitement of the moment and just simply have the conversation and say, I don't want to get stuck and I don't, don't want to get hurt. If you have something, I don't really care, but let's both be safe. And you know, maybe you could remove it. You know, sometimes I can say, look, you take it out of your pocket. If I felt like that was safe, not always, not everyone's trustworthy and you're taking a risk, but you know, you just kind of have to judge from the situation. You might've dealt with this person before. Um, 
this may be the least of their concerns too. And they might be thinking about something else, about the fight they just had or the car accident they were just in or, you know, getting their kids from school and, and suddenly you're asking them about a needle in their pocket that they totally forgot about, but you felt it. Sometimes I'll have them remove it themselves. Um, and that also lets them know that I'm not interested in arresting you for this. This is simply because I want to be safe. And so, your needle, you know how to handle it. I'm going to have you put it on the ground for me. And then we can move on to something else. But um, I think it's all about talking to people if you have the opportunity to do it. Um, it's not always going to work out, but um, you, you have to make them comfortable enough. Otherwise, they're just not going to say anything at all. And then when you do discover it, and then it might become an arrestable situation, then, then you know there's a lot more stress and drama from that. I think that you need to be careful with saying that, or be very deliberate if you tell them that you're not going to arrest them for having the needle. I think it's a great strategy to use to eliminate the possibility of them getting arrested and them trusting you more and telling you that there's a needle there. But um, you kind of have lost the ability to arrest them once you tell them that I won't arrest you for having a needle if you tell me about it now. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I think the articulation part is the most important part. I, I, I think you have to I think you have to be true to the position that you that you're that you're that you're that you're that you're sworn to do. I think you know being true to that position means that that you in fact at that moment you enforce the law. Your job at that moment is to enforce the law. Now, once again, I'm going to go back to what I said again. It needs to be done with the highest degree of respect. Everyone needs to be treated that way. But at that particular moment there, one thing about criminal offenses is it brings out the best sense of what I consider to be um, accountability in people. In other words, it's not like a, a bank robber robs a bank and he's running away and then someone stops him and he says, well, what did I do? I mean, he knows he robbed the bank. He knows there's going to be consequences behind it. And anyone that's in possession of anything, that whole notion of why they wouldn't want to tell you that they have it means that they know that they're accountable for something so that they know that something's coming. So for me, I would almost think it to be counterproductive. I, I, I like the notion of, 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 of de-escalating it to the point where you can get them to say, well, hey, look, you know, let's have you put this here, let's have you put this there. But at the same time, anything, be it a syringe, be it if it's a glass pipe, be it if it's a metal plunger, whatever it is, at that moment there, the moment that I let them occupy it without me having full control over it, in essence, I'm putting a weapon in their hand, even from having them put it on the ground for one second. It doesn't take much for someone to just turn around really quick and a glass is going to like just cut me across the neck. you know. So I think playing in that law enforcement capacity, working with the assumption that someone's going to have something, I think the best you can do is minimize the probability of something happening. And I believe the way you do that is, and use the word, Fear of arrest. I mean, you use the word fear of arrest. I would, I don't want to harp on the strength of the word fear, but if someone knows that something's going to happen, there is a fearful component that exists anyway. I think what you need to do is you just need to be what you were there to do. You need to do what you were brought there to do. Be an authority figure. Be the authority of a representative of the law, of the agency that you're there, and make it very, very clear. Look the person in the eyes and stay to them. Do you have in your possession a knife, a razor blade, a, gra a glass crack pipe, a syringe, anything that can break my skin, cause me harm, or create a problem between you and I today? It's as simple as that. Now, once the person gives you the answer, the person says, well, I have three syringes here, so on and so forth. What Jen said is, in, is the absolute truth. You have to proceed moving forward that there's going to be more. There's going to be compartments and coats. There's going to be little secret spots and knapsacks. There's going to be pockets when you pull them out. There's going to be little vials that are popping out here and there and all of these things. Oh, I forgot. I didn't know about that officer. I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, you have to assume that. But what I'm saying is, is it's, a, it's a probability game, and it's just minimizing the possibility. Once you now conduct your search, your field search, you're still going to go back to everything we were saying before and move with that same level of caution. So I don't know if you can really eliminate the risk. I think all you can do is just try to like just you know just minimize it and just bring it within a perspective where you can feel safer about going forward with the search. Excellent. And coming from the perspective of the injection drug users that we work with. Uh, one of the things they say is the most helpful is having that clear communication uh, so then they know what to do because the last thing they want to do is upset an officer oh, exactly. because then nobody's happy. So right. <laughs> having that clear communication is really important. And in North Carolina, though, we do have a lot of folks who are really fearful of getting arrested for carrying the syringe. And so sometimes they do want to tell the officer, but they're afraid of 
lot can happen because of that. So it, they're oftentimes in this catch-22 situation that's very, very difficult to navigate.